Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Wallace, for that kind of introduction. And most of all, thank you very much to NFU Mutual for sponsoring me and for believing in me and believing in GOAT. <laughs> I just want to show you this photo just to say how much I appreciate um, uh, the Nuffield family and just say how grateful I am for supporting Tim because while I was swimming with dolphins, <laughs> Tim was at the NEC food show um, in minus 19 degrees while I was basking at 30 and having a whale at the time. And um, just to say thank you very much, Tim, for looking after our three kids and the business and doing so well. Having the opportunity to study GOAT um, and niche markets, you've got the whole world at your fingertips. And I decided to go to these four countries. And uh, you can read more about it in my summary and to find out the reasoning behind it. But there are strategic reasons why I went there. I want to crack on now and talk to you about niche products because maybe you're sort of a bit confused of what a niche is. And there's some good examples up on the screen here. To the right is venison medallions. Left is goat's cheese. Bottom left, um, bottom left is Kobe steaks, which has different marbling. The marbling goes from the nose to the tail. And then there's um, sheep's ice cream. Now these products may look like regular commodity products, but they're actually something different. They're something unique, and they're added value. And for a small farm like ours, this is an ideal opportunity because you can sell smaller volumes, but to higher margins. Another advantage is there's fewer competitors. I'd like you to think about your own country's preferences. When I went to Holland, I thought, I wonder if I can sell goat here. Do you know I couldn't? They don't even eat lamb. You have to think about your own country's preferences. And one company that has is Osgazi, and I met Harry Kill there. And this company has thought about immigrants. Did you know that Turkish people eat soft cheese for breakfast? lunch and dinner, they produce 35,000 kilos a day for this market. And they're ideally placed in Holland where there's cheap milk field and where they've got distribution throughout Europe. Did you know that one million people visit the Notting Hill Carnival and that there's an opportunity to sell halal meat in the UK and it's on our doorstep? Another opportunity for us as farmers. I'd now like you to think out of the box. <coughs> How many of you have eaten halal meat? Just show me a hands up. How many of you eaten in an Indian restaurant or takeaway? Okay, you've probably eaten halal meat. <laughs> the goat, uh, the, sorry, the sheep on the right um, are destined not for Holland. They're being raised in Holland, but they are destined for halal slaughter, and then will be shipped just over the border to Belgium and eaten there because there's a higher immigrant population there. But what was wonderful is I loved the way that this slaughterhouse thought out of the box because the scrawny ewes on the left, you don't think how much value, but actually they're gonna end up in the World Food Bank in Africa. A niche was described to me as a nut. It's not like selling a commodity. We can't take our goats down to the local market and get a fair price. We have to think. So. How do you reach that delicious fruit in the centre? How do you crack that nut? And that's partly what this scholarship's been about. <clears throat> Some really good examples here, and hummus has been in the paper lately. Did you know the market for hummus in the US is worth 350 million? And, uh, and we actually turn over in the UK 60 million <coughs> in hummus. And how has it worked? Because in the 1970s, this is very much a hippie product. But what's happened is, We've taken it on board because it has the right, right balance of salts and fats and it's a very Moorish product. And the other fact about it is it's a ready meal that's convenient <coughs> in our convenience age. Venison is another wonderful story and I had to go to New Zealand to see this. Venison has been marketed so well and they have a Savena brand and the Savena brand is, is very useful because what happens is, since 1993, they have used a very efficient marketing and chefs to take Savannah to Europe and to the United States. 
and to reach restaurants and top quality chefs and to promote the meat because one of the problems with using these lean meats is people don't know how to cook it and so they've, they've grown that marketplace. And First Night Medicine will actually <coughs> fly chefs like Peter Gordon, who's a very well New Zealand chef, over to the US to talk to Whole Foods and to talk to Waitrose in the UK and to Tesco's and to inform the, the media and to get into the magazines <coughs> and onto the food channels to teach people how to use this meat. Another wonderful thing that New Zealand does is they, they think out of the box in Canada. So when our venison is in low production in the UK, they will use something called dovetail. So they will come in and supply what the British can't. And what's even more ingenious is these containers are tenderizing the meat in the bag as they're reaching our shores. This whole journey has been about how can I sell go to the British public? Do you know what? I bet most of you would neither want nor entertain goats. <laughs> it's, it's a product that most British people wouldn't even think about eating. So how do I persuade you, with your pound notes, to buy a goat? And the truth is, this is very difficult. And I was talking to other meat producers and they said, do you know what? Why aren't I selling something that people want? Why aren't I selling the iPhone and have people queuing up in the traffic centre to buy it? <laughs> So how do I create something that people want to buy? And then I thought, maybe I'm looking at this the wrong way. Maybe I have to think about who really wants this? And who wants it in the United States are the Muslims. And Frank Craddix is my guru that I met on my tour. And I'm very indebted to him because he told me, Marty, why do you think there are two million migrants in Texas? Because the Muslims are driving this marketplace. There are over 3.8 million Muslims in the United States, and this figure is growing. It could be up to 10 million. They don't know. And these people, I don't have to convince them if they want goat. They already know it's tasty. They know it's low fat. They know how to cook it. This is a ready-made marketplace. And you know what? The growing population in the UK is the ethnic market. It's now up to 9.1 million, and it's growing. And this is an opportunity as farmers to feed these people with not only goat, but lamb, which they like. Now there are opportunities. And I was always told, if you want to find goat, go to Brixton. So I went. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like being in Africa. It was absolutely incredible. It was so colourful and vibrant. I loved it. It was right up my street. But you know what? It was so fascinating that morning in Brixton. I went in there, and in the cabinets, they said goat. Goat for sale. And you know what? For a minute, they even confused me. And I looked closer, and I looked closer, and it looked really like goat, but it wasn't. It was mutton, and it's been coming in from Wales, and it's, it's sold for 4 75 a kilo. And the very, very cunning butcher said to me, do you know what, if you can bring it in for one for two, but I'll buy it off you. But a lot of these people have developed relationships, and some of them wouldn't even talk to me because I was a woman. So I said, next time, Tumi, come in with me. <laughs> And the, the issue is, it's far too cheap for me to sell, and it's also a hornet's nest in which I could probably get stuck. Because if I suddenly accuse them of mislabeling a product, I could be in deep water here. So, there is, there is opportunity to sell goat, but to sell goat to people who want to pay for goat. Because there is a difference between eating goat and mutton, and it is lower in fat and lower in cholesterol. So I've got to be focused on selling something that people want. And there are people with pound notes who are prepared to pay a little bit more for goat. In New Zealand also, what I loved was this tick sign for the healthy eating population. And on venison in the supermarkets, like Quick Save, uh, like Packing Save, we, I saw this wonderful tick sign, which is um, an idea that could be brought back to the UK. And this is for the um, New Zealand Heart Foundation to endorse these products. And so lean meats such as kangaroo, um, like the wagyu, like, like goat, could all have this sign on them to help customers choose lean meats. Because one in five of us at any one time could be on a diet. One in three women could, and one in four men. So this is the potential audience in. And the foodies also, they have to be key for goat as well. 5 to 10% of the foodies are our population, 
and their key to sell go to. My third message is to market using strategy. There is a place for goat to feed people, but I need to find the people who prefer this meat, and this is key. There's my nut. Now I need to gather all the information that I've got from my Nuffield travels to try and crack that nut open. So what conclusions did I bring back? I really have to know my marketplace in and out, who's going to want this product and how I'm going to reach them. And also know my place in the market, that I can't necessarily go in at the very cheap level at these um, halal butchers. The other side of it is I need to use marketing techniques. And we're going to be launching a new website for Chestnut Meats very soon. And this website is going to be bang up to date and a lot easier for people to order on. And it's going to be specialising in um, educating people about goat and about the recipes, giving information, it's going to be a wholesale page, and this is all new for us. Seasonality is also a great idea. There should be a season for goat. And in fact, the stewing peat is our ideal um, to be using this time of year, as you would for venison. And also, kids should have a season as well, just as veal does, and to play on that idea with the chefs. Chefs are so important in persuading people to, to eat goats and to eat kids. And if we can persuade chefs to get it on their menu and get people eating it in restaurants, perhaps they'll be more educated as to the benefit of eating goat. But what has to be one of the most important things that I've learned is about strategy, and that's whether having people growing goats for you or having partners selling it. We cannot sell goat by ourselves. We need other people. We're only a small farm. And one wonderful thing is that Nuffield's given me the confidence to approach strategic partners, and I'm going to be working with somebody in order to sell a ready meal to add to their range, and that then will make goats hopefully go viral. <laughs> also, what was key there is what I learned in America. Um, American tastes, they like quick foods, quick food solutions, salamis, jerks, steaks. They also like products that are easy to cook. We don't have to spend ages doing that, and the ready meal could serve that market. One thing I have learned is if the market changes, adapt with it and move on. And what, what's happened to us on our farm is <coughs> I've brought back two bucks from, from Holland with wonderful genetics because there is a demand for boar females now, boar females with pedigrees. Up to now, we've always been commercial, and so now we're going to be breeding these wonderful billies on our females and registering them for the first time, which will give them triple the value. So you can't get that. <laughs> the other thing I brought back is we've always struggled with how to feed the goats. And we had, first of all, very basic feeders. But the goats would always damage themselves or break a leg or get into trouble. And so in America, I saw a wonderful angular trough. And I'm going to be selling these to um, smallholders and also um, goat breeders. And they said, how wonderful to have something that's already ready-made. So we've already got two in production and want to be making more and galvanising them. So as a Nuffield bonus, thank you very much also for teaching me so much about goats and so much about meat goats, because finally in Texas, I was normal. <laughs> <laughs>